Well, we have um, a very small group today, which is great. And hopefully that means that you can participate um, a little bit more than normal. So if you would like to come on camera in the next uh, few minutes, I'll do a quick introduction or let everybody do a quick introduction of themselves. Um, but we'll go ahead and get started and then uh, go to introductions of the participants and then launch into the second piece. But while we have our guest speaker here, um, we'll go ahead and get started with the content delivery. So welcome to Tag Data Science and Analytics Learning Series Data Thinking Workshop about communicating the data science story. And uh, with us today, we have Bill Franks, who's going to talk to us a little bit about um, what it means to communicate a data science story. And then uh, next, I'll go into um, more details on the mechanics behind it. So Bill, let me let you take it away. Okay, thank you. Let me uh, real quick share. All right, is this coming through now, Beverly? Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah, and I apologize to the folks on um, in advance. I'm a little under the weather today. It's not COVID, it's just a bug, but um, I may not be my usual energetic self, but I'm going to give it my best shot. The, um, the thing I'm going to do here is just do about 10, 15 minutes of setup for the topic based on um, the book I had come out. I guess it's been about a month and a half now called Winning the Room, and it's all about creating and delivering an effective data-driven presentation. And this is something that obviously those of us in data science and analytics do all the time. But this is also something that applies much more broadly. People in marketing are constantly getting numbers and putting them in a presentation to then go present up, up their chain. People in operations, uh, engineers, scientists. So it's a broad issue here in terms of how to present what's often technical information to a non-technical audience. So I'm gonna walk you through just a few points to think about uh, today. So what, what I'm gonna do is mainly focus on the first and third points, the planning uh, and, and the delivering. We won't have time to cover a lot in 15 minutes, but I wanted to cover some of the main strategic underpinnings of what you should be thinking about before any given presentation. Some of the more tactical pieces, I think, uh, if we have more time, we could get into, but uh, it's easier to review those on your own without any color commentary as well. So I'll just point out as we do it, this is not, a book or a talk about data visualization. Obviously, visuals are a part of it. It's about a live presentation to a non-technical audience. So that way it could be on a Zoom, it could be in a room. And so what this means is two things. You're going to notice both in the book in here that my examples are uh, our visuals are very simple. And they're made to illustrate a specific point very easily, but also whether we love it or hate it, 95% of presentations today are done with basic Excel and PowerPoint, no matter how fancy of visualization tools people have available and how many experts they might have. Most presentations are still done with basic stuff. So I, I tried to keep it so that it would target the typical person who would be putting together a presentation. So with that, I'm just gonna go through a few of the tip numbers. There are 119 in the book. Um, obviously I'm gonna pick a few. Uh, tip number one is that results are not the biggest factor in success. And this I think is something you have to understand uh, and is very difficult to accept especially for folks who are, who are younger in their career. And the reality is at most 50% of your success in a data-driven presentation is gonna be accurate results that tell something that is of importance. At least 50% is how well you package, present and position those findings to get somebody to actually take an action. And that's not me minimizing the importance of accurate results, right? In an ideal world, that's all that would matter. In practice, it's not all that matters. And in fact, early in my career, I had a couple of really good analytics get completely ignored because I went in and thought that just having these numbers was what I needed to demonstrate. And without having a story behind it, without having the business context and, and more of an interaction with that audience, I just didn't get the job done. So you really have to take very seriously putting together a presentation. Don't let it be an afterthought. That's one of the biggest mistakes people make. The deadline is, is next Friday for a project. So sometime late Wednesday night or early Thursday morning, you decide it's time to start putting together the presentation. This presentation at the end, right, wrong, or indifferent, is going to be a huge part of your success. You've got to give it the time it needs. 
Another thing to keep in mind is that data literacy is a two-way street. It's not one way. And what I mean by this is that most people think of literacy as the ability to read or receive information. If you look in the dictionary, it's actually reading and writing, sending and receiving. And one critical error that technical people will often make is, well, I'm gonna try and be a little more simple than usual, but really the business people or the other non-technical people in the room, it's their job to be able to understand what I'm saying. And they need to get themselves up to speed. They need to be literate. And there could be truth to that. It's entirely possible that some of the business partners you work with aren't as literate as they need to be. However, you have to look at the other side of the coin. It's probably at least as likely that you're also not being very literate in how you're, you're set, uh, preparing and then delivering your information. In other words, it's on you as much to provide the information in a digestible fashion as it is on your audience to be prepared to consume it. And you know the, the, the good analogy for this I like to use is if I went to an elementary school, a high school, and a graduate school today and talked about analytics, I would talk at three very different levels because those audiences would be reasonably expected to have vastly different uh, backgrounds and capabilities to understand anything about analytics. The same is true in a data-driven presentation. You've got to make sure that you're talking at a level appropriate for your audience. And if you don't, you're going to lose the audience and they're not going to take action on, on uh, what you've done. And you might just get yourself pigeonholed as somebody who's, quote, too technical. And that's one of the worst places you can be if you want to have an impact. And so the, one of the other big things that I see people mistake all the time is the whole point of a live presentation is to tell a story, not write a story. You should keep your content on your slides to an absolute bare minimum, and it's your narrative. So here's a typical slide. Looks horrible. You've seen ones like this. Uh, while this is slightly exaggerated, I can be honest with you, I probably see slides at least this busy uh, probably every week or two somewhere. Uh, it looks horrible. And here's the problem. I'm sure even as I'm telling you that this is just an example to illustrate how bad it looks, you're probably having a hard time resisting reading what's on that slide. And as you read what's on the slide, you're specifically not listening to what I'm saying. And worse, if it was real content, you'd start to make your own inferences, you'd start to think about it, you'd start to make assumptions. And now not only are you not listening to me, but I've lost control of the narrative, I've lost control of the story, and I've lost you as an audience member. So what you have to think about is if, if all you had to uh, give people is exactly what's on your slides, then you don't need a data driven presentation. You can just email it to them and tell them to send you questions. The point of your talk is to add extra info. So what you can do in a case like this, if you go back here, action one, two, three, four, are kind of buried in the middle at the top of the orange boxes, just have those four things. And now I can talk to it in all the detail I need to. I could spend 10 minutes on each if I wanted to. I would actually also use animations on this chart so that one of them came up and when I was done talking, then the other one would come up. That way, even if someone wanted to read the slide, they're done in a half second and now they're back focused on me. So when you're doing a live presentation, you have to forget about a paper, you have to forget about uh, detailed documentation, you have to get down to the bare essence of what you have to show so that while you're talking, people will have some context and that's it. And like I mentioned, facts and figures are definitely not a story. It's not about, so you see these numbers, and so that implies these numbers, and that implies these numbers. A story means you've got to lay out, you know, what is it you found? Why would it be compelling to that audience? How are you going to get that across to the audience? What are you going to, what are you going to recommend that they do? And then as you're talking through the story, try and get them excited, you know, not in a, not in a cheesy used car sales way, but say things like, wouldn't it be great when we can? Or imagine once we're able to, uh, as you talk about the, the potential impacts of your, of your models. And the thing is, you've got to be up there and just kind of having fun talking about what you found. And if you do that and you're comfortable, your audience is going to be comfortable and they're going to get into it as well. They'll build off your energy. But if all you're doing is reciting figures, they're going to get very bored very quickly, no matter how compelling those figures uh, might be. And similarly with keeping text short, charts and graphs are a lot like jokes. And the reason is that if you have to explain it, you fail. Your chart should err on overly simplistic versus overly sophisticated. You should only add complexity when there's a very specific reason. I see people all the time trying to come up with fancy charts with crazy color schemes, 3D, 3D figures with shading, et cetera. Those don't add value. Your goal in a data-driven presentation is not to win an award for having a beautiful presentation. 
that could be a secondary nice thing to have if you had time. But your real goal is to impart important information to your audience in a way that they take action. And if you can do that with some simple basic slides, do it. Because the more you have to explain it, it's just like a joke. I can explain the joke. You'll understand why the joke is funny at that point. But it won't be as funny to you once it's explained. It's only funny when you get it on your own. And there's another reason why visuals and charts are a lot like jokes, because most of them are bad. And no matter what you read about or hear about, you've got to be yourself and be authentic when you're presenting. This is something that I find people make a mistake about. They get so uptight and then they just stop being themselves when they're talking. Uh, I went through a presentation class probably about 10 years ago with, with the company I was with at the time. And the instructor was the nicest lady. But what she was doing, she was standing up front and you could tell she was trying so hard to follow the guidance. So she was standing very straight. She was counting out and she'd go, so point number one, and she'd hold it out at this 45 degree angle. Then point number two, and she'd have her fingers perfectly spaced. Point number three, and the point is she was following what she was telling us to do to a T, but it was so inauthentic and so forced. So what you have to do is relax. And I break a lot of, of official presentation rules at times. And I actually sometimes get good feedback, even, even from the things I have broken, because people aren't worried about, did he break a, a presentation official protocol, they're worried about, oh, did I, did I understand what, what was said? And if they are, they're happy. They, they couldn't care less uh, about uh, as much about your delivery style. So you can't do something um, you know, really off the wall and you, you, know, you have to have uh, some polish and some uh, ability to, to think on your feet, but don't overforce trying to be formal and rigid or you're gonna go less. And then the other thing to keep in mind is that it doesn't matter what you found, what your research was, the audience is really buying you at that moment that you're in front of them. They've got to trust you. You could have a literal award-winning presentation. That's one awards that you go up in front of a room. And if you don't do a good job of presenting it and having them believe that you have some credibility and knowledge, it's not going to matter. So I'd rather have a really bad slide deck where people believe and trust me than a great slide deck where they don't. Now, ideally, of course, you'll have both. But the point is, it doesn't matter if you have a 20-person team that worked on this project for three months. If you're the person in front of the room at that moment in time, everybody's buying you personally. And so you have to take that very seriously. And even as you decide as a team, who's going to present what, you want to think it through. Because each person you put up there, the audience has to buy into them individually and separately. One person that comes across as completely non-compelling non and uninformed could derail the entire project. Because if you, you don't know who did what part of the project. Just the last couple things is, you've got to practice your presentation before you go. And I mean this literally. So very few people would say, I'm gonna go write a paper or a blog and draft it first time and post it. People tend to proofread those things. I'll bet very few people on, uh, on this call would go and draft slides and immediately go present them without going back and looking them over a few times. However, for some reason, people think it's completely okay to get in front of a room and present live for the very first time having never verbalized your points before. It's gonna go equally poorly. I can't tell you how many times over the years I've been in a hotel room, just walking back and forth across the hotel room, just kind of walking through what I was planning to say. And the reason is that when I do that, first, by hearing myself say it, it solidifies in my head what I'm gonna say, but secondarily, I guarantee you, every time you go through your presentation, particularly if it's new stuff, you're going to find places that you can't remember what you wanted to say, or you realize, you know what, point number three really needs to come before point number two. Now that I hear it, it just doesn't make sense. You'll find all kinds of things that you need to do. So you do it once or twice, then you're going to be ready to go. But you've got to take time. And ideally, you could do this in front of somebody too. get somebody from the, the team you'll be delivering to who's kind of a confidant or a friend and have them you know, give you some honest feedback. But you've got to practice it. At the same time, you can't overprepare. And this sounds counterintuitive, but at some point you're frustrated, you're tired. You know, if you keep practicing and practicing, at some point you have your whole thing memorized. If it's memorized, that's really only a half step up from just reading it. If, if I was to sit and just have everything I'm going to say so memorized that I'm rattling it off like a robot, it's not going to be very compelling. What I typically do, I just write a few bullet points down for myself around every, every slide or every topic. And then I'm forced, even while I'm live, to then put a narrative around it. So every time I could talk to the slide 
10 times this week, I guarantee you I've never said the same thing twice because I don't actually have it scripted. I know a couple points I want to make. And every time I go through it, I might do it in a slightly different order or I might add another example. It's, it's uh, a point where you want to know generally what you're going to say and that it flows well and then you want to stop. And then last, we go to some questions is you've got to adjust your story to the audience. And this example here is one that a friend of mine, uh, Brent Dykes, had in his book on, on uh, data storytelling that I adapted for mine because I loved it so much. You know, here is the old children's tale, Little Red Riding Hood. And these are five different movie versions of it from over the years. So you have like a 1950s classic. You've got the, the second one from the left is kind of a modern drama romance. There's a comedy cartoon and then Little Dead Riding Hood you know, some kind of horror movie. So here's the point. Any of us could watch any of the versions of Little Red Riding Hood there, and we'd all come away with the general storyline. We'd all understand the flow of the story of Little Red Riding Hood, even though it was delivered totally differently. So if I were to go into a little kid's birthday party and I throw up Little Dead Riding Hood, I've likely lost all my play dates for the next year. If I put on Hoodwinked, it's gonna go well. If I'm on a college campus at a fraternity party on Halloween night, probably putting on a little dead riding hood might go over pretty well. So the point is, even when you have your presentation, you have to adjust given who you're going to be talking to. And that, if you're going to give a talk to marketing today and finance tomorrow, you might say different things. Now, the good news is, if you're keeping your slides minimalistic, you might not have to change much or anything about your slides themselves. What you change is how long do you spend on each slide? How deep do you go into the concepts behind each slide? So with the uh, finance team, you're going to go a little more into the ROI and the cost implications and the cash flow implications. Marketing, you probably go a little more into what, it, you know, what the implications for customer satisfaction are and for, um, you know, promotional effectiveness and so forth. So it's not that you change your story or, or are um, not getting all the facts across, but you're doing it in a way that's relevant for each audience. Now, in an extreme case, you could have a broad range in the room. And this happens the bigger the presentation, the more likely you could have multiple executives from different parts of the company in a room. At that point, what I like to do, I just say up front, look, I've got a little something for everybody, but I know that I won't have the depth that any of you want in your specific areas. And I'll be happy to have a follow-up conversation if you would like. That way they, they understand that, that I know that I won't be able to go as deep as either of them would necessarily like. Now, at the same time, if there is one person in that room who I do know, even though they're all... Um, maybe parallel senior execs within the company, if there's one that is going to control the, the, the decision point for what I'm doing more than the others, I would still play up a little bit more to that person than to the others. Um, but uh, particularly when you have focused audiences, you've got to, you've got to target. So with that, I think, uh, Beverly, I'll just stop um, sharing and we can just have a chat. Awesome. Thank you, Bill. Hey, I have a ton of questions <laughs> All right. that I want to ask, but I want to give the floor to um, some of you guys <coughs> that are that are on the Zoom. So if you want to, um, let's see, under reactions, if you want to raise your hand, I will notice that and I'll call on you. Or if you want me to read the question, just put it in the chat. Otherwise, I'll go ahead with my question. So, um, Bill, thank you again. Um, Hero's Journey. Do you ever use that as a framework or a template? And just so that people know what that is, it's kind of like the Cinderella. I use it all the time. So it's kind of like um, you set the stage and say like, you know, once upon a time, and then there was usually this tragedy. And then here's how this person came triumphant. And then they rode off into the sunset. Believe it or not, you can apply that kind of template to data science storytelling, to podcast interviewing, to all kinds of things. Uh, do you use, the hero's journey or some other kind of template or framework? I know you talked about Red Riding Hood. Yeah, no, I don't use, I, I know the hero's journey thing you're talking about. So the, the, the book is focused not as much on storytelling, at, just like it's not about visualization. It's not about storytelling from, let's say that's a little bit of the academic perspective. Here's the arcs and here's how you want to word things. It's really about that live presentation. What information's in it? What information's not in it? There, there are some tips on how to organize it. I, I think it's more important to, so to me, when you're at the hero's journey level, that means you've got a really solid story that you really like that's pretty much baked. And now you're able to then tune it to say, wow, we can make it more powerful if we can map into this art. Most people yeah. in reality aren't going aren't to get there on a typical presentation. They got to just make sure I've got the right facts. I've got them in a reasonable order. I've got them presented well, and I know how to, how to talk to them. 
So I think it's it's um, you know a, a more advanced. If this was a if we were doing a, a four million dollar eight month analysis for a, a Fortune one thousand company, probably it's worthwhile to put that time to make sure you're following all you know and going really really deep on a monthly promotional analysis. You're going to run into the VP's office and and giving them an update for twenty minutes. You know probably you can be a little more a little more tactical. So it's like everything, depending on the importance of the presentation would depend on mm -hmm. how formal you'd be on the different components of it. Gotcha. Okay. Um, I, I'll keep going if you don't mind, since sure. I don't see any in the chat yet or any hands raised. Um, you talked about um, the, the tips, like multiple tips. What do you think has been the hardest tip for people to accept? Like what's the hardest thing for people? Like, do they tend to over prepare too much? Do they tend to like what's the most difficult tip that people forget? Boy, I mean, it, it, there are so many. It depends on the angle you're coming. I would say the one that's the often the hardest for people newer in their career to accept is that very first one that the results really don't win, win the day because we wish they would. Oh. That should be what matters, right? But it's very hard to accept that the results will not be enough and that you have to do all this other okay. stuff on top. And that's one, if you yeah. miss that, you're dead, right? Now, on the other, on the flip side, I think a lot of times folks, there, there's any number of things folks will forget, right? They'll sit and they'll just start writing and writing. And next thing you know, you've got six bullets per slide with three lines each in a 14 point font. And again, for you to organize your thoughts, that's perfectly fine. I often do that. When I'm creating a presentation, the first pass, I literally just start typing, what do I want to say? Um, without worrying about how long or short or how it looks. And then when I get it organized, then I go back and I start saying, all right, now what visual would I put with this? And what's the keywords that I need to put on there and eliminate uh, most of it. But what a lot of folks will do, they'll just slap it down. And when it's what they would want to see, then they go and present it. But what we as technical people want to see is a lot more than what a non-technical audience wants to see. And that's, a, that's another thing people go wrong. It's too much detail. Too much detail will undercut your credibility, mm -hmm. not help your credibility if you're the technical person in the room, because it's, uh, it makes everybody confused and uncomfortable. And they're like, I just don't understand this stuff. Maybe I'm just better off sticking with what I did last month. Ah, okay. So number <laughs> one, realizing that the story is not enough in and of itself. Like the results, the data is not enough by itself. And recognizing that there's something else, you know, there's a more human component to this. The second big flaw is um, people putting too much data, too much information into their um, mm -hmm. delivery. Those are the two biggest ones you think? Yeah, and even, so in the data perspective, <clears throat> one of the things I didn't show today, but imagine if you had five products, four quarters, you put a grid. Mm -hmm. That's 20 data points right there. Now you add your totals by product and by quarter and overall. Now you're up to 30 data points in a, in a table on a slide. The reality is that might be a great leave behind for someone to have to examine in depth on their own. But when you're in front of a room, you don't want to be putting 30 numbers up in front of them. And there's probably one single thing you want to talk about at any point in time. Maybe product number four had a, had a nice upward trend over the past year. Well, make a slide that just shows a basic bar or line chart for product number four with just those four data points that illustrates that exact point. Then have another chart that illustrates your next point. Over the period of that presentation, you might cover every number on that table, maybe more than once, but you're doing them in little pieces while you explain the relevance of each. Right. And in the end, you can say, by the way, here's the table that I'll leave for you behind that all these numbers are derived from. But you don't, you don't leave it up. It's more of just, just to cover off with people. Yeah, I have the detail. I'm going to move on. But it's it's breaking it breaking feel it so, just so much. it won't feel so overwhelming just like splash in your face all of a sudden but it's like one drop at a time. Well, and, and it's uh, more than see. that though too, Beverly. Beverly, it's it's not just yeah. one drop at a time. But remember, you want the audience listening to you and focusing on you. And when you put thirty numbers up, they might see something else on that chart that intrigues them that has nothing to do with the point you want to make. Now you've lost them, and they're going to miss your point um, and possibly. Um, be thinking about something you didn't even want them to think about. I see. Okay. All right. So then they're off in la la land. When you talk about um, prepping, but don't prep too much. So what's the, what's the rubric? Like, how do you know when you've prepped enough? You mentioned that the signal is that you kind of generally know the content, but you don't like have it memorized. Is that, can you give us a better understanding of that? Yeah, so this is one I think will be a little more, you know, people have to personalize. Some people may have a different level of comfort. I've done enough of this over time that typically I'll do, say, 
one dry run with the, with the stuff when I first have it. And that's going to be pretty rough. I'm not real happy with that. Mm -hmm. And then another, maybe mm -hmm. a day later, I make some tweaks based on that. Then the next day I'll do another one. Um, I typically will be done after two or maybe three um, runs um, because I, I, I know that I, I more or less have it down. So I think the key part is that you just want to be comfortable. And some people, it might take six or seven times and that's okay. But you just want to get to the point where you're confident that you know what's going to happen. Now, the other thing you can do, and I wish I had a printout here, I always print out the, um, in PowerPoint, for example, you can print the view where like there's four, six or nine slides on a page that are like just the mm -hmm. image of the slide. I often mm -hmm, will also mm -hmm. have those out because what I'm able to do then, I'm, I can look down at that as I'm talking and remember what's coming next. And if I get derailed with questions, I can easily say, okay, we just lost 10 minutes. I'm going to skip these couple of points. And I can, you know, I'll literally sit and exit off. Looks like I'm taking notes. I'm actually exiting off points of my talk as I go, but I can have my main bullet point or two. I can hand write that in on under those uh, slides. If there's some, if there's a point that I keep struggling to remember or that I just, I want to make sure I make a point, I'll literally just hand write it on there. And that's just a way to, to nudge yourself towards the things that you want to say. Oh, that's great. That's a really good suggestion. Um, okay. So, Again, y'all feel free to jump in because I'm using, I'm using up all the Q&A. Uh, so three more questions. How do you undo, you know? And, and so this is related part A and B. So like, how do you undo? Because a lot of people have already been, they say things like, and I try to teach my students not to say this, but they say things like, as you can see. Like, dude, don't say as you can see because they may not see it and, it, and and it's kind of condescending. And that's like saying it's already in there and why do you need me? Um, sort of to one of the points that you made earlier. So how do you kind of undo and where are we supposed to be doing this? Like at what point, where, where are we missing, especially in the data science career journey? We're, we're missing it somewhere because people will go all the way to like teach data scientists and still not have these skills. Well, that's a great point. So the interesting thing, the, the way the book came about, honestly, was I've been, you know, I've, I've, given i don't know how many presentations over the years and i've watched probably at least an equal number and i always see things that have annoyed me but it was when i came to university and i was teaching the master's capstone class for the first couple of times and you know these students they're master students so they're at least in their mid-20s some of them are older and working um, they're smart people uh, but their first presentations were often just really 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 bad and that's what it hit me you know people it, it, i learned it on the job you've learned it on the job they, they don't teach this so in the in the in a university setting and even a lot of these certificate programs and all, you're typically focused on the technical things. What is a regression model or a neural net? And how does the math work? And how do you write code to make it happen? And that's all important. Don't get me wrong. But in a typical STEM degree program, you're not going to get what we're talking about unless you, you, you know, you more seek it out. So I think that's the key. People have to intentionally uh, focus on this. And I can tell you, you know, if you're someone and there's plenty of people who just want to code for a living, who love coding, getting the details, cranking through the data. There's nothing wrong with that. In that case, you might not need to worry about these things because it's not going to be a big part of your job. If you desire to move up the ranks to a director, a VP, CAO, CDO type role, you're not going to get there if you don't learn how to do this kind of, uh, this kind of, of, of presentation and understand where those lines are that you can go up to but not cross depending on that audience because it's... Um, the audience knows exactly when you've lost them. You have to practice mm -hmm. to know when you've lost them. It's not obvious to you necessarily yep, yep. if you haven't done this. Before. I, I hope everybody heard that last part, especially that if you want to advance your career in analytics and data science, you have to have the skills to communicate things like this. You have to be able to deliver these kind of um, presentations. Or you, even, even not a presentation, you have to be able to win the room um thank you bill uh okay so question from the audience how how do you understand the audience and like how do you know if your audience is understanding your interpretation of the results yeah the like how do you know things. what level and you know yeah a couple of things here so first of all if you're working in a company and you're delivering internally over time, you should be making it a point to really get to know the people and understand the business, et cetera, et cetera. Now, I come from a consulting background. What we would do, sometimes you're going in a little more cold. You try and identify a sponsor, a, a, 
a confidant within the client organization that'll give you some advice. So I mean, they'll say, hey, Beverly, you know, I know I'm coming to present to Bob and Sue next week. Can you tell me a little bit about what they probably are looking to hear next week? Like, what are their hot buttons today? You know, here, let me run through these numbers. Which of these are going to grab them? Which ones aren't? So ideally, you're getting somebody who's on the inside of where you are to give you that feedback. I think the other thing is you just have to really watch the room. I always say uh, it's not hard to tell if somebody's not buying what you're saying. They'll, they'll, you know, they'll sit back, they'll look grumpy. They might even say some grumpy things. I like to head that off right away. I'll just say, hold, hold up. I can see some of you appear either, either skeptical or confused. Can you help me understand why that is? And I try, and I, I mean, I want to draw it out. I want them to come at me if they're going to come at me because better to get it out and let's get it done early and I can try and address it than to ignore it and let it fester. It's one of those things you have to become comfortable with. Encourage the, uh, the, the tenseness and encourage the negativity to come out because when they get it out, now you know what it is. If you just sit and ignore it because they're looking grumpy, you have no idea how bad they're going to derail that later. And people will typically be a pretty good sport about it, right? And if you're willing to listen and you're willing to say, um, okay, I hear what you said and here's why I don't think that's a concern, et cetera, et cetera, you, you can often dig yourself out of holes before you get too deep. Now, sometimes there's just somebody who's negative doesn't like the project, never agreed with the project to begin with. You just have to handle them carefully. You, you can't sit and get in a back and forth argument for an extended period with an audience member. At some point, you have to just kind of say, look, I, I'm sorry, you know, obviously you're, you're, you're uncomfortable with some of this. I'd be happy to set up a, you know, another conversation later. Normally, someone who's really being aggressively negative in a meeting does that a lot and other people are annoyed with them just as much as you are. And the room will normally come to your rescue because it's, and nobody wants, to be waste their time while you and I argue for 20 minutes, Beverly. I mean, the only time that even possibly happens is if you were the VIP in the room and everyone's afraid to, to step in and, and try and cut it off. But that awareness though, yeah. helps you head that off and, and take care of it up front. Yeah, and I think that EQ sometimes is, um, uh, data scientists can often struggle with EQ and just being able to sense you know, how people feel just by looking at them or being able to feel the mood of the room. And sometimes that can be a little more difficult. So you have to really be deliberate. It sounds like just not just um, do what you think and do what you, you know, don't focus on you. You got to focus on kind of the room more. Well, I'll tell you the flip uh, side of this that I'll tell you another mistake people make. Yeah. This is a classic one. Talk about reading the room. We talked about the negative side. You got to be aware of the positive side. Let's say you've made it through three of your five key points and everybody's excited and ready to get going. Stop. Mm -hmm. Say, hey, great. I'm glad that that looks like everybody's bought in. You know, I can send the presentation has a few more points. You know, why don't we why don't we talk about implementation? Right. I mean, the, every piece of information you give after somebody sold is another piece of information mm -hmm. that could give them a second thought or that could somehow take them down a rabbit hole that unsells them. So there's a point where if you've achieved your goal, yeah. stop. Um, and people will talk themselves out of that. You know, people who are professional salespeople say, you know, don't 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 sell past yes. There's variations on that theme. I think it applies here very, very much. Your, your room can be turning negative on you, but you also got to know when, man, they're ready to go and just embrace it. And yeah. I'll make them own it. Hey, I can tell you guys are ready. If you'd rather talk about how you can implement this, um, I'll let you all take the conversation from here instead of me presenting more at you. They might go, oh yeah, that's great, Bill. Yeah, let's, let's get on this. And you're, you're, you're done. You're, you've succeeded. That was your goal. You don't have to worry that yeah, you didn't come all your slides. I've heard from salespeople and different sales processes that you're not supposed to keep asking for the sale when they've already said yes, because then they start yeah. going, well, did I miss something or yeah. why are you keep asking? <laughs> That's great. Um, okay, so two more things, if you don't mind, uh, Bill, and thank you for spending so much time with us. Really appreciate you. Yeah. Um, you talked about um, like buying you and some people get like irritated with that phrase and they don't really understand what you mean. Like, obviously, we're not talking about selling ourselves. <laughs> but we are talking about selling ourselves in a sense. Can you just clarify what we mean by, um, you know, you're, you're sort of buying into you? What does that mean? Yeah. So, you know, if there's numbers and there's figures, you would say they've got to buy into the figures, meaning they believe them, they trust them, they're ready to act on them. What I'm saying is that those numbers and figures, if you're not credible and they don't trust you and they don't believe you individually as a human being, they're not going to believe the numbers that you show. If you come in, you know, you can imagine mm -hmm. it. You know, again, think about movies. There's the really cheesy guy with the hair all greased back who talks really fast, who's coming in and talking about this great jewelry deal that he's got. It might be possible that he really does have a great jewelry deal, but nobody's going to believe the guy because he comes across poorly. 
It's the exact same thing right. in a data-driven presentation. It's the numbers, people have to trust the numbers themselves. And, and you know, for example, if they think the database is a disaster on which you pull the numbers from, no matter what you say, is not going to convince them to trust that. That's a separate issue. But even if those numbers are solid, if I do a horrible job of explaining it, then they start to go, well, I know the data is good, but you know, the way Bill explained that, I'm not sure if he did what I thought he was going to do, or I'm not sure if they did that right. Wow. I would have filtered it this way instead of that way. And so it's your own, it's really the buying of you means that you're credible, you come across as credible, honest, trustworthy, and as somebody that they're willing to bet really their career on, right? Because any decision they make impacts yep, their career. Yep. And the bigger the decision, it could literally be a career maker. Um, and I've had times in my career where I had to present something that was going to impact someone's career, whether they did or didn't do it. And to me, that's a responsibility. You know, I wanted them to really understand what am I saying? Why am I saying it? And what, what do I think the implications are? Now, they might not always follow that, of course, and that's their prerogative. But, you know, I always took it very seriously that, that I want to tee them up to, to best make the, the right decision for them. And to do that, they have to decide that, that I'm someone that they, they trust with helping them make that decision. I love it. Thank you. That's good clarification. It also sort of touched, but I still get my one last question, but just a quick comment on that was that it sort of touched on um, ethics too, that there's a certain ethical component. And the second thing that it kind of touched on is that you can't just win at this. You have to have awesome data. You have to have your project itself. You have to frame the problem right. You have to have a, done great analysis and you have to communicate. I mean, it's all like a package. You can't just have one great version of you know you can't you can't greatly deliver a crummy project with or greatly deliver a great project with crummy data like all you have to hit all of them so you can i'll tell you one thing kind of that full cycle here, here's a couple examples too that i talk about in the book around where we shoot ourselves in the foot sometimes which is as technical people especially data scientists what do we love to do we love to make sure we caveat all of the assumptions, all of the data quality issues, all of these other things. And there is a point where you need to have those documented in appendix, or if it's a really major assumption, like let's say, you know, it's a huge hundred million dollar real estate investment. And literally the interest rate six months from now, if it fluctuates by more than a half point, it's going to destroy the whole thing. Well, that's one you got to call out and spend some time on. But a lot of times the reality is the assumptions we've made and some of the problems we found aren't substantively changing the analysis enough that it's likely to directionally alter the entire decision. So if I'm saying there's a 10% promotional lift and I'm only confident it's plus minus two, if all you need is 4% to have a success, even in my worst case, I'm double, you know, or, or double or one and a half times what, what you need. So the point is you also want to be honest at all times, but you want to focus on the positive aspects and you want to be positive. So, you know, one example I talk about in the book is around, let's say we had a, uh, an analysis and I come in and I go, well, great news. We have, uh, we, you know, our product line, we've done analysis of all of our products and it looks like we can roll out this new program for all of them. Unfortunately, we're having a problem with the specialty, the specialty category, and we don't know if we can roll it out there yet. We're going to have to do some more work and then we'll be able to know if we can roll out the specialty category. That's a true, but somewhat negative versus coming in and saying great news. We can start the rollout for every single product we have in our line with the exception of specialty products. We're validating that and should have it within a couple of days. By the time you, by the time you're ready to do it, we should have the answer. It's the same information, but the way that you position it and the way you stress how you talk about it can make a massive difference in whether someone interprets it as positive or negative or as compelling or as minor. And again, I'm never saying that you want to you want to over overdo it. I mean, we see people in the news all the time taking great liberties with with a chart or a graph to make a, a point that matches their, their narrative. I'm not suggesting that, but there's often plenty of different ways you could explain a given point that are positive. So focus on those and, and then be honest about, but don't overplay the negatives. Because if you've got, again, every product but one ready to go, that's a lot of great news. Why bring everybody down with yeah. one small piece of bad news? Yeah, no, that's a great point. Um, and then my last, question to you, Bill, is um, do you have somebody that you really admire that uh, you can watch and that, or that you would suggest? Like, I'm, I love Andrew Ng. NG, I love Andrew Ng. And um, personally, there's this pastor in Peachtree City. His name is George, Dr. George Dillard. And I love the way he presents. And he, he has so much that we can learn from. Are there certain people that you would recommend 
Boy, that's a tough one. I've never been asked that before. Honestly, I mean, it'd be hard for me because I think different people, there's there's different things that, that I, I like about different people. Some people are very energetic and I appreciate their energy. Other people are very good at explaining complicated things. I mean, you go back and you think about when I was growing up, like someone like a Carl Sagan who explained all this science stuff in a way that, you know, kids in school even could, could kind of understand. That's a whole different, you know, a whole different area, but it's, it, I think he was very boring at the same time. So he got across information that I could understand, but in a very boring way. Then there's people who make a really exciting talk. And at the end you say, you know, that was a lot of energy and we did, we, we did all kinds of gimmicks during the talk, but really there were like three really, you know, simple points at the end of that talk, but that can still be a great talk if it gets you energized and gets you focused on those three key points. So I just say, you know, nobody, go out and watch, go out, watch a lot of people. Cause there's a lot of different approaches back yep. to being authentic. That's great. Nobody in particular, but try to pull whatever nuggets you can. Um, I've been in situations where I don't necessarily want to be in that situation, but I'm in a situation and I'm having to watch something, whether it's um, political or I don't know, I hate politics. So that's probably it but some kind of situation. And uh, I take advantage of the opportunity to watch other people just and how they try to win the room and influence people. Um, and think, and I think to myself, well, how can I apply that? So it's, I guess that's what you're saying is there's not necessarily one person, but sort of try to pull the nuggets from different contexts and see how you can apply them. And I'll tell you, Great. I'm a big believer uh, over, over time, you know, I played sports and stuff. So I've done, you know, I had coaches talk about, you know, visualizing back when I played soccer, you know, practicing penalty kicks, you got to visualize where you're going to put the ball and all this kind of stuff. I think it's the same thing with, with presenting it as well. When I, if I'm going into a room for an important meeting, I'm literally visualizing myself uh, in my head. Not, I'm not necessarily literally in a video thing, but I'm going in there confident. I'm saying to myself, I'm going to go knock their socks off. They're going to buy this, right? This is good stuff. I believe it. They're going to believe it when I'm done. And by doing that and getting yourself kind of pumped up, just like sports teams do before going in a game. They're going in believing they're going to win that game. They're stretched out. They're loose. They're ready to start playing hard. Similarly, take a few minutes before any given presentation, review your thoughts, get yourself in the game. And, and just like an athlete would do, you say, all right, I got to go in there. I got to go in there and sell them on this. And this is going to go great. doesn't mean it always does. You lose games, right? But I think it, it, it really can give you an edge by getting yourself in that mindset that you will win the room and that you can win the room if you go in with the self-doubt, oh gosh, I'm not sure if I have enough and I'm not sure if they're going to buy it. People will pick up on that in a heartbeat and you're, and you're dead. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, I think some of it is just the acknowledgement that you, you have to win the room. There's, I mean, that's part one is just to figure out, I think um, you said that, I forget how you said it exactly, but just that your data is not enough. <laughs> so very good. Excellent. Uh, well, it looks like that's the end of the questions. We have a quick announcement. Um, Arwisharia, I, I Sharia, sorry, I don't know how to pronounce that exactly, but you have won a copy of Bill Frank's book, Winning the Room. So thank you for asking your question earlier. And um, just put your, if you want to DM me with your um, email and phone number, we can get that to you. Great. Awesome. Bill Franks, thank you as always for um, participating and being a part of our learning series. And um, you guys, I, I sent several links in the chat. So you, you have his link to uh, LinkedIn and Kennesaw State and his BillFranks.com website and the book from Amazon. So hopefully you will follow link, uh, Bill Franks. So thank you again for being a part of this. Right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. All right, the rest of y'all hang on. <laughs> Don't be going anywhere. <laughs> um, so that was wonderful. If I can get y'all to do quick introductions, since we have a small class, then we'll get started with part two of, um, of our learning series. This is um, what we would normally do this in person, but given the um, most recent you know, pandemic that we dealt with, we moved to online and then the second one we moved to online because it became more like a customary thing. And now um, this one is online, but normally we would be in person. So can we go around the room real quick and just do some quick introductions? Um, preferably just, you know, your name. If you have, if you're with a company, with the uh, company and your affiliation, and then uh, a third would be a word to represent um data 
So I'm going to say Beverly Wright. I'm with Birchworks, which is a recruiting company uh, in the Chicago area, but we handle the whole country. And I'm the chair of TAG Data Science Analytics Society. And my one word is discoveries, that uh, you can pull discoveries from data. So Arsharia, since I already picked on you and slaughtered your name multiple times, could you say hello to the group? Yes. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Aishwarya. I'm from Bangalore, India. And I'm working as an intern at STS uh, Worldwide, which is in US uh, Atlanta. And uh, I'm also currently pursuing my MSc in Data Analytics from Christ University. Yeah, I want to be a, a data scientist. And for that, we need to uh, communicate and interpret the results which we uh, uh, get. So I'm here uh, to learn that. Thank you. That's fantastic. Absolutely. And you said you're getting your MSA from where? Is it MSA or MSBA? Yeah, MS, a Master of Science. In, in analytics? Yeah, data analytics. Oh, okay, MSDA, gotcha. And what school was that? Sorry, I didn't get you. Which, which school was it? I missed the school. Yeah, it is in India, uh, Christ University. Oh, okay, gotcha. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, welcome again. Thank you. All right, um, Mike? Do you want to say hello, please, and introduce yourself? Sure. My name is Mike Frank. Um, I'm a cybercrime prevention consultant with Aflac Incorporated down in Columbus, Georgia. Uh, previously held analyst, analyst and leadership positions in our operations analytics and analytics center of excellence. Um, but now I'm kind of on the fraud prevention and, and account takeover side or fraud prevention detection and account takeover prevention um right. i am i've sort of almost crossed paths with you before i did my mba at georgia tech and graduated in 2013 so i've kind of followed seen some of your stuff as you've you've gone through um and we're there um as far as a word um you know sometimes overwhelming um, you know, we oh, deal yeah. with, yeah. It, it, not necessarily in, in fraud analytics, instead of looking for the needle in the haystack, we're looking at the haystack and trying to make sense out of, you know, anything that may be problematic or, or out of the norm. So it's definitely been a different, uh, transition from operation analytics and leadership and decision, you know, decision support uh to preventing fraud and identifying what's an edge case versus what's you know what is uh you know normal customer behavior and the wide range of things that a, you know that a customer may do that might be completely you know, completely in the norm versus something that might be fraudulent so uh overwhelming is, it's funny is how that's a good word Go for ahead. it and uh the application um, from a security standpoint, have been very much growing lately. And so it's really interesting to see um, data science sort of being used for good. Nice. Well, thanks Thank for joining you. us. Let's see. Yep. Who else do we have? I can't quite read these names. Um, whoever wants to go next. Hey, Beverly, it's Hallie Middlebrooks, and I am now with Wallaroo. And Wallaroo is oh. the last mile for data scientists. We help you get your models into production, whether it's on-prem or in the cloud. We are a, an SDK that snaps into like your Jupyter notebook and we can get models running, multiple models, model chains using about 85 less percent compute. So we've taken workloads from GPU down to CPU, which is pretty impressive. And then also providing right. observability across the whole model lifecycle. Very good. And your word, would, would it be efficiency? It sounds like it might be um, or something else. I would say money. <laughs> okay. It is money. The work you guys are doing is ROI, has real ROI once it gets to prod. 
So. Yes. Yes. And people don't, I think in our field, we don't even, it's, I'm so glad you said that, Hallie. I'm looking at Wallaroo right now. Um, I'm so glad you said that because we're, we're real weird about talking about money. Like <laughs> analytics, data science people, we're just really weird about it because it's, uh, it's, that's ultimately, especially in the for-profit world, that's what it, uh, it comes down to is you're either trying to help make more money or help reduce um, the amount of money you have to spend. But we're really strange, like about about that. We're trying to optimize models, and we forget that it's actually for money. Yeah, so I'm glad it, you said that. We talk about the fact that you know, up until you get to production, everything is the investment. You need the return on investment. Yeah, the project refunded, and uh, that's what we help our site that's great. do with, like a single line of Python or a click of a button, take away all the mystery of ML ops. Love it, love it, love it. And we like to and sponsor then, uh, the group society too. So talk to me offline about sponsorship. Oh. Yeah, I definitely will. And then BTH. Um, I can't, my contacts are blurry right now. It's a uh, Bob. Oh, yes. Oh, Bob. Okay. Bob, can you say hello? Oh, oh okay. Uh, Bob, home renovation going where he is. Oh, <laughs> background noise. Okay, no problem. Uh, West Rock is a large paper packaging company. Um, a lot of y'all might know them. They've been a client of, of, um, of mine before. Part of the digital accelerator and innovation team. And his word is speed. That's very good. All right, well, I hope nobody gets hurt during the renovation. So great. All right, what a wonderful team we have. So let me share screen if I may. And oh, I'm going to go, I'm going to share this way because I may want to pull something from the interwebs. Okay, and um, we're probably going to finish a little early because we have a smallish group. And um, these slides are going to be made available as well as the recording. So you'll notice the subtitles too. I hope that doesn't bother y'all. Um, I've as being an educator, I work with you know people with disabilities, and it's just kind of like a habit now and a best practice. So there are usually subtitles running across the screen. Quick uh, agenda is I'm going to talk about the learning series, and then um, data science storytelling. We already had Phil Frank's introduction definition, and then I'll talk a little bit about the importance before we go into kind of methods and a final exercise. And then I'll tell you some of the other things that we have going on with. Um, we tag data science and analytics. Okay, so the learning series. Uh, we just this year, we being Technology Association of Georgia, Data Science and Analytics Society, this year started a learning series and the whole series is called Data Thinking Workshop. And the Data Thinking Workshop um, learning series as stage one, stage two, and stage three. Stage one, we already did, um, I, I wanna say it was in February, not sure if you have that exact date, uh, Jessica, but February, and we recorded it, uh, and that was about setting up the problem with the incredible Jordan Morrow, who talked about data literacy. Um, if you're not familiar with Jordan Morrow, he is like the inventor of data literacy, like he's great. Um, and Jerry DeMasso from Access Group has, has been a partner in some of the content. The second stage that we talked about is about developing findings. So kind of once you have you know, not that these go necessarily in perfect order, but once you set up the problem and have some understanding data literacy, then you sort of develop findings, direct value, and Michael Javian, or Michael Kelly from Javian talked about that, and I had some uh, use cases as well. And now we're on phase three um, of the learning series, and this is about communicating the story. And so Bill Franks literally wrote the book about winning the room and communicating data science storytelling. Also, I'm going to go over um, some content as well. So this is kind of the big picture. If you've um, done stage one, stage two, and stage three, then you earn a certificate from Technology Association of Georgia's Data Science Analytics Society as part of completing the learning series, which you can then proudly display. Um, if you were not in person or live on stages one and two, you can still watch the videos that will go out in a follow-up email and um, you know, promise, <laughs> confirm that you've reviewed those and then still earn the certificate. So even if you missed phase one and two, you can still earn the certificate um, just by watching those. Cool. 
All right. Data science storytelling. Uh, I, I like to start with this quote um, because I'm trying, what I'm trying to say with this is that you, having your data is not enough. And I'm, I'm sort of glad that Bill Franks covered this exact point that in God we trust all others bring data and even with the data, it's not enough. So it's not enough just to have good data. It's not enough to just have great analysis. You have to uh, tell the story in a way that's compelling. You have to have formed a relationship before they will even begin to listen to your story. So there's a whole set, <laughs> there's a whole ecosystem that sort of has to um, um, be right in order for this thing to birth something meaningful. So why is this story so important? Um, let's see. Oh, okay, good. Why is the story so important? Well, does anybody know who this guy is that's standing next to me? That's my pre-COVID weight. <laughs> but does anybody know who this guy is on the left? Any guesses? You can blurt him out if you know who it is. Do, do, do. Well, I put his name right here. But anyway, Tom Davenport is widely considered the father of analytics. Um, the grandfather, by the way, is W. Edwards Deming, who, if you're in quality, I'm sure you know, Deming Prize and all about him. And Tom Davenport said, if you don't want your analytics results to be ignored, you should probably devote considerable attention to the way they are communicated. Wait, what? If you don't want your analytical results to be ignored, why? Not rhetorical, I'm actually asking y'all. Why in the world? Would Tom Davenport start off with a phrase like that? Why would he start off with, with that kind of phrasing? Thoughts? Anybody know why or, or have a suspicion? Why in the world would he start off with, with that kind of negativity? Well, it's because it's common, it's very common for analytics results to be ignored. Are you guys catching this? It's very common to have your analytics results ignored. So that's why he's saying, unless you want the default, the default is they're going to be ignored. Unless you want the default, you better devote considerable attention. Okay, so this is a real, a real thing. I'm not trying to start off negative nearly, but I told you I use a Cinderella approach, right? So we're going to go down before we come up. <laughs> so the importance of the story. Um, and when I say telling a story, I'm not just talking about the presentation, but also the content. Oh, and the presentation presentation too. So, but I'm talking about the content, but also the presentation presentation. Um, and so what happens if we have a negative response? And by negative oh, I don't believe that, or negative of that's not right, or negative of, oh, I don't trust that result. I, Y'all, I had, um, I was watching a presentation a couple weeks ago. It was the final presentation for a project that was done. And the consultant said, I, so I asked a question about how the data was um, coded. And they used um, binary, and this might be a little tricky for some of y'all, but hang on just for a second. So there's a, a scale, and it was kind of like if you think about, you know, sad to happy. And so let's say it's a three-point scale. There's super sad, content, and then super happy. Okay. So instead of coding it one, two, three, they coded it super sad, one or zero, content, one or zero, super happy, one or zero. And there, they actually did have a valid reason why they coded it that way instead of just doing one, two, three. Um, because when you separate them, they become independent events. But anyway, um, and the way they described it was, well, regression can only handle binary X variable. And I said, it's a good thing you're presenting to me <laughs> because you would be thrown out for that one comment. So if you lose, if you get a negative response when you give a, a crazy that was crazy for those of y'all that don't know that was a crazy explanation terrible terribly wrong and crazy 
So <laughs> um, I love the person who said it, but come on. Um, if you lose respect um, by saying something like that, or if you, you know, if you don't say things in the right way, that's it. So you could, they could, you could lose respect for yourself as an individual. So just by um, poorly presenting something. Number two, these are not in any particular order, but they sort of do go more grand. But number two is they don't appreciate the value. They may just be like, well, they, that's just, that project stinks altogether. I'm not listening. They may have said one thing wrong, but now I just don't trust any of it. You know, so they sort of learn to um, disvalue data science projects, period. And number three, this could have even broader impacts where they say, well, that whole data science thing is voodoo. That's just smoke and mirrors, not really much to it. Um, and so it's, it's not just about you. It would definitely be about you at the beginning, but it could, it could actually have an overwhelming um, image transformation to the, the negative, especially in, um, if you're dealing with people, like salespeople are great at having a golden gut. And if you're trying to get them to like, hang on, let me show you the data, it's, it can really irritate them if they feel that something, anything is negative. So you gotta, even it's not, there's a ton of benefit of doing this right and doing this in a way that is, you know, consumable and influential and positive. But there's also, that's a carrot. There's also the stick of like, well, yeah, but if we mess up, it's even, it's even worse. You know, so that's uh, more motivation as to why this is important and how we should take care with it. Okay, so why the heck do we have such a hard time? Um, like, why, why is this such a big deal, you know? Well, part of it is, um, I sort of call it the sheiks and the geeks. The, the sheiks um, are the kind of cool kids, S-H-I-C-S, like they're chic and they're cool and they're neat and they trendy and all that kind of stuff. And then there is the geeks. And okay, now I'm overgeneralizing big time, but you'll get the idea. So the analysts, the data science analyst people, we care about things like how, how well does my model fit? Look at my cool diagnostics. Look at this neat modeling technique I used. You know, I created this new metric. Isn't it cool? That these are the things that we care about. You know, I used to have kind of an analysis paralysis, especially early in my career, where I didn't want to stop. I, I hated ending a project because I was like, oh, there's still so many things I can get out of this data. You know, don't make me stop. <laughs> um, and that's the kind of stuff that we care about. You know, so that's why, like, um, Hallie, you were talking about money. We don't think about money very often. We are thinking about how do I improve this model? Like, how do I make it like really cool? You know, those are the things that get us going. However, what we should care about is uh, kind of the manager's perspective. And these are, the managers are usually the people that are consuming the analytic or requesting the analytic. And what they care about is actually answering the business question, <laughs> whatever the business question was, like how do I increase sales? How do I uh, get better at loyalty? How do I reduce the cost of shipping things? You know, how do I become more efficient in my operations? Like that, what they want to know is um, answers to the business question. They also want, um, aside from, you know, big impact, they want to look good. They want to be able to say like, if we make these two little changes, we're going to see a huge increase or a huge decrease in, in cost. They want to look good like that. They want to have that kind of superpower at their fingertips without having to do the technical stuff. So that's what managers care about. And in general, analysts care about something completely else. We're truth seekers and they're money finders. So truth seeker versus money finder, that's why we have this, this conflict. That's why we have this you know, communication. It's just like, it's not connecting. Does this make sense, y'all? Is this, are y'all um, tracking here? Yeah, for sure. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Thank you. So uh, I won't go into um, historical too much, but just to say, feel free to look this up. Florence Nightingale took a very, very simple approach to displaying data about the crappy conditions of a hospital. Like soldiers were dying just from going in the hospital. So ironic. 
And because she made a simple illustration, big changes happened. Mendel, on the other hand, he was a brilliant monk that found all this cool research about pea plants and genetics. And about he was able to broadly define some things about genetics. And um, his results are, were ignored because they were so hard to follow. So how you tell the story um, makes a big difference. It's not just the quality of what you find. Okay, the components of a good story. Uh, there are multiple versions of this model, and this is general. This is just Beverly Wright edition. <laughs> but generally speaking, you know what? I didn't really introduce myself. <laughs> I'll do that in just a second. But um, generally speaking, this is what I've witnessed over um, over the years. So let me do a, a <laughs> it's kind of backwards, but let me do a quick introduction. Um, I've been in analytics and data science for about 30 years. Um, I've been a professor for about two decades. I taught undergrad, master's, doctoral students, and executives at multiple schools. I've also been on the client side. I used to work for Southern Company, Truist, and Cox Communications. Um, I also, I'll never get used to saying Truist, y'all. That's a tough one. Um, I've also been a consultant for about 12 years at companies like um, Access Group, that's a local consulting group um, here in Atlanta, and Nielsen, which you're probably familiar with. And uh, now I'm at Birchworks, which is a recruiting company, and um, I help with executive recruiting and to help, you know, in some ways kind of guide the ship. Linda Birch is retiring, so I'm one of her replacements. And um, I also am the chair for Tag Data Science and Analytics Society, where I run Tag Data Talk podcast as the host. I'm also vice chair of the Analytics Society at Informs and immediate past chair of the Analytics Certification Board also at Informs. Cool. So that being said, I've seen literally hundreds because I've been lucky I, my degrees decision sciences analytical methods and marketing science my degrees are all like decision sciences you know before it was called data science um, and so I got into it really early and because of that I've done literally hundreds either an individual contributor or a team lead or as a professor because my students have to do real projects with real data to solve real problems so with those hundreds I've noticed a pattern of the stories that tend to sell, the, the stories that tend to get consumed, the stories that tend to resonate with the analytics consumer, and they have these components. That's why I'm going to walk you through um, these components real quickly. Okay, the first part that we usually start with, uh, and the problem statement is a problem. <laughs> it's a big problem because uh, nobody knows how to write a great problem statement, and there's not, <laughs> well, very few people. There is not a single method template you know this is where i want to write a book and i never have but i should um, but there's not like a great single source that says like generally accepted in our field here's how you state a problem there's not but the closest thing i can find is by um there's a lot on problem solving so there's very few on problem framing so there's a book by pianca jane and it's called behind every good decision and um, Jessica, I don't know if you're if you're able to type that in, but if you can, it's Pianca Jane, J A I N. They can find it with last name, and it's behind every good decision. It's the name of the book. It's a great book. It's one of my favorite books. The there is a section in there. It's only about eight or ten pages that talks about problem framing. It's great. B A D I R is the problem framework. You can um, also do the Cliff Note version because I did a podcast interview with her for Tag Data Talk. Um, and you can listen to the 20 minute podcast interview or read or read the book. So oftentimes the problem, stating the problem in a way and actually understanding what uh, needs to be solved is really tricky, y'all. So, for example, an airline, I could talk about this forever and I won't. I'm just going to give two quick examples. But an airline um, client of mine said we need to work on optimizing our on time delivery. Well, we also did a safety project for them, which was very difficult to define too. But okay, 
on time delivery, hmm, or not delivery, on time um, arrival. Okay, what's considered on time? <laughs> and what's arrival? Like if there's a middle and then the end, uh, end of the leg, I mean, every little nuance was uh, tricky. You're going to have to figure out, well, why are you trying to, what are the consequences of not being on time? And how do we balance, you know, because what are the consequences of being on time? Like there are things that have to happen. You have to like break your employee's neck just to be on time. So the problem statement itself is really tricky. One more example that I'll give you guys. Um, so I'm in the I'm in the city of Atlanta. Well, I was in the city of Atlanta off of Howell Mill, and now I'm in Cartersville, which is um, in the suburbs. So we don't have quite the traffic that um, we did in the city city. However, <laughs> if someone said, what's the problem with Atlanta traffic? You know, I would be like, oh, it takes too long to get anywhere. Well, what if it takes too long to get anywhere? Do y'all hear me? That's what I'm saying. It takes too long to get anywhere. Hmm. Okay. Seems simple. And if someone said, oh yeah, well, if it takes 45 minutes, what if I could get you there in 55 minutes, but you don't have to drive? It's a self-driving car. You don't have to, like, not only do you not have to drive and it's a self-driving car, but there's like zero, like you could take a nap. I mean, it's not self-driving in today's terms. You could take a nap, someone's driving you or whatever. Like you could do work, but it's 55. Oh, well, all of a sudden the time is not the problem because I'm going from 45 to 55 and I'd rather do that. Now we realize that the actual problem is the downtime, not just time, but downtime. Like I can't do anything but sit there and the stress of being able to having to deal with traffic. And so maybe the problem wasn't the time all along. Do you see what I'm saying, y'all? Like that's so framing the problem is um, typically our first step on um, on any given project that we have to tell the story we talk about how we frame the problem usually the second thing that we talk about when we're telling the story is the story behind it now um this is tricky also because this is where politics come into play and us data people we don't like politics generally speaking we don't like them at all <laughs> so it can be difficult to get the reality about why this problem came about or why this business question is being asked now but usually we ask you know things like what is it and what it isn't so it isn't this thing but it is this thing did something break or is this an opportunity like did we all of a sudden not sell our product and or did was there a new regulation in the carbon black field and now we have to modify the way we think or modify the way we communicate our story. What's happening? So uh, being from regulatory, the regulatory world and utilities, things can happen overnight. And when I was in financial services. So find the story behind. It can't just be nice to know. I mean, that's just people don't spend the kind of money they do for data science for things that are generally just nice to know. So it's got to be some kind of real story behind it. It's just tricky though, because um, let's see if I talk about this. No, I don't, I don't have it in here. But normally I have this um, statement about the why, why? It's W-H-Y, W-H-Y, like the real reason why. So I'll give you one story to go with this. Um, I did a project with um, my team and this was for a huge company that you've never heard of. It's one of those behind the scenes companies that make a ton of money, but you've never heard of them. So we went through the whole thing. And as we're going through it, the key person on the project, he kept saying like, this doesn't make sense. This doesn't make sense. This is weird. And I'm like, go back to the client, you know, talk about this. And this was one where I was trying to, you know, really be hands off. And um, I had a little bit of a suspicion that it was going to come out the way it did. But they were moving forward with it and we moved forward and we finished it. Okay, great presentation. One of the best that my team, this particular team member that was leading it, is the best one I think I've ever seen, you know, in a while. So great job, but it still looked kind of quirky on a couple of things. Well, I didn't find out until two or three months after the final presentation that the real reason they wanted us to do that project 
was the data science people were trying to prove to the IT people the concept of GIGO. Are you guys following me? That's yeah. very frustrating. They basically used us <laughs> uh, as a way of uh, clarifying to their IT group that you can't just give us crummy data. You have to give us good data. We're never going to be able to extract real insight out of it until we see good data. So as frustrating as that was for me and my team to produce something that wasn't actually wanted, I mean, the actual results were not wanted. The results of this doesn't make sense, that's what they wanted because they wanted the IT group to understand, like, you got to really invest to have good data available to your data science team. Um, that's the real, that was the why, why behind that story. Difficult, very difficult to get. The third thing that we usually talk about after we've kind of problem, uh, framed the problem and talked about why this information is important, why it was requested, is the data. Now, the thing that I want you to notice here is that data is not the first step. If data is your first step, if that's the first thing you talk about, if that's the first place you go, you're, the whole thing's, you got a problem from the get-go. So any data science project that starts with data, unless it's like a data exploration or you're you know, mining or something like that. Um, but generally speaking, if you're trying to solve problems and improve decision-making, you should not start with the data. You should start by framing that problem, figuring out what you're trying to figure out. So that's the biggest thing to, um, to talk about here. But normally we talk about where it comes from, what are the limitations, um, how's it cleaned, the proxies that were used, like ideally we wanted this, this, and this, but here's what we got. Uh, and so we're, you know, we're kind of making the best of it. I've had, um, well, I'll tell you a story. This was an athletic department and uh, one of the biggest, most valuable nuggets that they got from a recent presentation was here's the data that we wanted that we didn't have. In order to really answer the business question that you posed us at the beginning, we needed this, this, and this, and we didn't have it. And that was actually more, almost as much, if not more valuable than the findings that they provided. So knowing the data that's desired, not just the, the ones, the data that you have, but the data that you want in order to answer that question is, um, is a very good thing. Usually the next in the process is to talk about the model itself. You know, which model did you choose? What was your, your justification? Did you look at competing models? Um, and how, how did you make this choice? Was it has something to do with how your metrics were measured or if you were looking at interrelationships or how do you justify like neural nets over, you know, decision trees or regression versus um, canonical analysis or, you know, something other, some other bivariate like PCA versus factor. So, uh, or not bivariate, sorry, multivariate. So um, that's usually the next step. And um, this is a, a really important part where you've got to be able to <laughs> talk about this in a way that your analytics consumer will understand. You don't have to go into like major, major, like here's what, you know, when you talk about neural nets, for example, explaining that they use, they're, they're emulating the human brain and neurons and the way the neurons fire and what those relationships look like is enough. You don't have to go into like the nth detail of uh, your method. The next phase usually involves the relationships. And if you think about a simple, like something simple, like a regression, these are usually your beta coefficients. Um, even if it's not a regression, a lot of times it's your betas. So your beta coefficients are really, those are your findings most of the time. Um, now, for data scientists and for quant people, this is where we think we're done is we're like, oh, well, I gave you the results. You know, this is a presentation of results. I gave you the results. What do you want? <laughs> but we can't stop here. This is like running a race and getting to the, you know, you're, you're like 20 feet, man. <laughs> just, just finish it. Don't be just standing 20 feet before the finish line. This kind of ties into what Haley was just saying. Uh, but anyway, so we can't just stop at the results. We have to actually recommend something you know that otherwise like what that's why 85 percent 
you guys have probably heard this term or this uh, statistic that about 85% of the projects that are done in data science are not used. That makes me very sad. I mean, if 85% of the widgets that you produce in a factory were thrown in the trash, you probably wouldn't get to produce widgets for very much longer. So we got to get better at problem framing. We got to get better at telling the story. We got to get better at these kinds of, you know, producing actionable results. And so that's what this has to do with is stopping too soon. I have too many examples to even give you on that one. And lastly, um, is again, it's not even last, but it's the big, the big rocks. Um, so one of the last things that we talk about are the actionable conclusions. Now, I know it might seem silly, but I strongly recommend to people that they um, either handwrite or just, just even in a one PowerPoint slide, just what is the business question you're trying to solve? A paragraph. And hold on to that all throughout the process. Because when you get to the end, go back. You might think that you know, like, oh, I know exactly what I'm trying to do. I know exactly what they're looking for. But when you get to the end and all you have is a bunch of beta coefficients and results, that are you actually answering the questions that you were trying to answer from the beginning? And so this is where it's best to go back to the business question and make sure you're answering the business question. Also, your conclusions need to go beyond what's nice to know. They have to be relevant and actionable. And I know this is hard, y'all. I know that I know that um, it's difficult to get to, to responses or to findings and um, get a response from your analytics consumer that makes them go, I'm going to go do something right now. <laughs> like you gave me some ideas. I got to go do something right now. Um, but this is where oftentimes we're, we're falling down on delivering the story is what do I do? So you should be able to answer, so what and what now? You know, so yeah, this is the answer. So what? What now? You need to be able to answer that sort of thing. Harder than it sounds. Okay, the the um, quotes don't come through properly, so I'm going to skip that for a second. Okay, let's see. Our last, um, I have one last thing to cover with you guys, but I wanted to get a read and any kind of thoughts and comments um, from the group before we do our final exercise. What do you guys think um, is, has been the hardest for you or the thing that you've noticed that other people just, like we keep messing up? Like what, what sort of things are you seeing? I see a lot of scope creep or what if, and, and it's especially depending on what business unit you're working with where there's, or you have a inability to wait for the answer for the data outcome. Um, and I've had to, you know, had business units that had a ready fire aim approach to everything. And, you know, something we, we really felt like we needed to do something and we couldn't wait for the good decision. So we did what felt right and a lot of conversations have occurred that reminding those leaders that observe is a verb. We can mm. watch what's going on and keep track of what's going on and monitor the situation while we do the analysis and gather data and test hypothesis. And that while it doesn't feel like the best thing um, from keeping the data clean, especially in an operate operations standpoint where you're dealing with, you know, say claims data or call center data. If you're moving, shuffling people around, it makes the analytics more difficult in the future. And so sometimes observe is the verb and, and it's tough to get leaders to, to follow that. Love it. That's very good. So what do we do about it? That's the big problem, right? Any other thoughts before we go to our final exercise? I know um, Mike's getting some work done. Uh, Arshar, Arsharia, any thoughts or comments from you?
Okay. No. So, let, uh, okay, cool. The last thing I'm going to ask y'all to do, let me um, go back to Sharon's screen, is a little exercise. This will only take a, a minute and it's kind of fun. So um, I know this, you may be like, oh, well, you've never actually done this. I've done this. <laughs> I've done this exercise many times. Um, I've used it with board meetings. When I was at Georgia Tech, I did it with the um, MSA board. And I've done this, uh, I've done it a bunch of times, but the, the probably the most memorable time was um, on Snowpocalypse. Snowpocalypse Atlanta at, in the in one of the top floors of the SunTrust Plaza building, which I guess is now called Truist Plaza. Um, and it was so cool because you could like see, you know, you could see everything happening in real time and everybody freaking out. It was kind of scary. But anyway, we had a whole group that we shipped in. And what happened was um, I had developed these segments to describe the um, banking consumers. And um, my boss at the time was a CMO, chief marketing officer. And he uh, wanted the sales teams that were reorganized based on these segments to be able to really deeply grasp and absorb their segments. So what he did was he had, he had me do this exercise. So I'm gonna ask you guys, um, to do this exercise as if you're them. You could, again, keep in mind, you could do this with all kinds of things. I did this with invisible fence too when we used dogs instead of weather, like different pictures of dogs. Um, weather is kind of the most basic and generic form. Um, with with banks uh, and banking financial services, you could use different types of dollar bills or different currency. So anyway, you'll see why in a second. All right, so if you worked at a bank, you know, pretend like you do. <laughs> um, there are customers that are great, and then there are customers that are more difficult. So I asked them, choose a picture of a customer, you know, that you would consider to be like a great customer, and then choose a picture to represent like terrible customer. Now, what I actually asked them to do is choose a picture that most reminds you of your segment. So I gave them all these statistics about their segment. Uh, this guy's called the high income borrower. He makes a lot of money, but he borrows too much. He's not good with credit cards, you know, all this stuff. Um, and he's generally this age and he makes this much and he's usually married, has 3.6 kids. I mean, all these, you know, stats and stuff like that. Been with the banks for like four years and all he cares about is getting the lowest fees, you know. So they had a statistical profile of these groups and I asked them to pick uh, the one that best suits um, the best suits their their segment. Okay. Now, as a general exercise, it, it can be like best and worst, you know, that kind of thing. But for the bank, I said pick the picture that best suits the personality of that segment. So it didn't matter which picture they picked. What mattered is conversation that followed it. So to give you an example, all right, high income bar. I'm literally picking these at random, y'all. High income borrower. So this guy, I'm going to pick this picture. What this is like, this reminds me of the high income borrower because he's always like changing. He's like moving all the time, like the wind, you know, he changes jobs a lot. He is moving a lot. He's always looking for some kind of loan. He just, I feel like he's always just going. And it's weird because he's um, spending money to go on vacation, but he can never enjoy anything in life because he's always moving. So do you see how that picture kind of goes with the segment? In the same way, I could have picked this picture. And I could have said, oh, gosh, he's kind of a hothead. Um, he is a little volatile because if you don't give him the best possible rate, and lowest fee for banking services, he gets all, you know, explosive on you. But he's a plethora like he's a well of of revenue because he's always paying late fees <laughs> or whatever you know i don't know i'm just making this up but um you also could say you know that that this represents him i mean there's sure they chose what's important was that they were imprinting they were imprinting these images on um on their segment like this is the segment that they're going to own and they were imprinting these images on them 
and it it left a memory and it created this etched in version of this type of consumer the the output you get from say a statistical package typically looks like this <laughs> uh so if you're going to tell a story about segmentation results i tend to do the image type of discussion over using stuff like this you know this is this is the output from a segmentation um analysis and it doesn't it doesn't really work that well i hope that made sense okay so to finish us off um just real quick the tag data science analytics society um, we're all about connecting inspiring analytical minds we want to innovate data provide thought leadership and build a community i'm not sure how big the community is in columbus but i know you guys have thesis down there and aflac so that's that's good that you're um, building that community uh we want we strive to deliver relevant content content um, as a way of connecting inspiring analytical minds some of the things that we have uh, coming up, um, we have this learning series, as mentioned, this is part three of three, so we probably won't do it again until next year. Um, we also have a for good initiative, which I'll find the, the link and make sure we send it in the follow up email. But the for good initiative, um, I'll talk about more in just a second, but it's basically data science for good. We also have the innovation awards. So if you uh, in your department or your company, if you guys have done some data science you think was really innovative, you can submit your project as part of the innovation awards, which happens uh, November the 17th. So, so these, the work is judged. We've had um, work from all kinds of big companies like Coca-Cola and Southern Company and places like that. We also hold events about every other month. Um, we have some coming up for ethics, analytics, talent, and then uh, data science superpowers for good. And we have a monthly podcast called Tag Data Talk, which I hope you'll take a listen to. Um, again, Jessica, if you're if you're able to provide a link to Tag Data Talk, that would be great in the chat. So just to real quickly go through uh, some of those, the nonprofit, the For Good Initiative. This is where volunteers actually work on a project. Um, the project right now is called Enduring Hearts. It's about improving the life of a heart transplant. Uh, the, they don't last that long. They only last like 17 years maximum. And so researchers are trying to improve the length of the heart. And the data science um, project that we're doing for them right now uh, is really about how to get more funding. So it's, it's very transferable to business. The next one that we're doing is about foster care and helping kids that age out of the system not go homeless because oftentimes they do. So if you want to get involved in um, Tag Data Science Analytics for Good Initiative, um, you'll see a link come into your email or you can reach out to me on LinkedIn. The Tag Data Science or Tag Data Talk is our podcast and um, you can easily find it, um, Tag Data Talk, and I think there's a link in the chat. Um, we've got some great, great, great guests on Tag Data Talk. We actually just got number seven of the top 25 data science podcasts in the world. Uh, so it's really good to see that um, that ranking. So please take a, a watch and or listen to Tag Data Talk. Big thanks to Big ID for being our society sponsor. Um, they've been a really good supporter. And I just want to say thanks to all of you guys for um, your involvement in the data science and analytics community. Any other thoughts, comments, questions about today's session? You will get the slides and the recording. This was really good. Thank you, Beverly. Yeah, absolutely. Great. Well, my pleasure working with you guys today. Thank you again for participating and uh, connect with me on LinkedIn. I hope you all have a great afternoon. Thanks, you Bye too. Now.